Hamilton Arts Council serves arts communities within the greater Hamilton area, including Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, Glambrook, Hamilton, Stony Creek, Waterdown, and Six Nations of the Grand River. We acknowledge that this area is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie Neutral Huron Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. The land is covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, which is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Hamilton Arts Council envision a dynamic arts community that is in innovative, impactful, diverse and professionally sustainable. And at this point, I'm going to turn the session over to uh, to our guest presenter. I'm very, very pleased to uh, to welcome Abadar and I will stop my screen sharing. And Abadar, over to you. Thank you, David. And hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank the Hamilton Arts Council for having me as the facilitator for this workshop. I'm excited to spend the next hour talking about money. Um, I think it's a topic that we don't talk about enough, but it's very important. Um, I'm just gonna introduce myself. And, uh, first, I'm gonna describe myself. I'm a light-skinned brown person um, presenting as female. I have uh, shorter shoulder length curly hair. I'm wearing round um, glasses, wearing a navy shirt. And behind me, there's a lot of office clutter. I'm uh, at the office at Hamilton Artist Inc. where I work as the programming director. Um, so yeah, my name is Abadar Kangari. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm an artist. I have an interdisciplinary practice. I work um, mostly in performance art and video art. Um, and I uh, explore what it means to be an immigrant through my work. Uh, but I'm also a curator. I'm an arts worker. Um, and sometimes I'm also a writer. And I know um, I'm, I'm looking at people in the room. I recognize some of your names. I know some of you are members of Hamilton Artists Inc. So it's so great to be in the space with you and thank you for coming. So I'm gonna get my screen up here. So this workshop is the uh, Fair Payment and Compensation Workshop. Um, and as David mentioned, it will be recorded and shared with everyone afterwards. So don't worry too much about taking notes. So um, the first image I'm sharing here is a pin. Um, it's, it says, has the artist been paid? Um, the image has some uh, pins that are pink and some pins that are black. And these were made by Carfac Ontario. It's one of my favorite pins. Um, and I used to wear it all the time. Uh, but I think uh, all of us know that oftentimes the answer is the artist has not been paid, actually. The artist has been exploited. So in this workshop, I'm going to introduce um, fee structures in the visual and media arts. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what to expect when you're showing your work in different contexts. We'll talk about pricing and selling artworks. Um, and how to negotiate and why it's important to do so. And that's a, that also ties back into the, the community aspect of being an artist. So before um, I go any further, I'm wondering if um, there's, I think, around 13 or 14 of us here. Oh, there's more of us now. Great. Well, thank you for new people for jumping in. Um, before I go further, I'm going to share some polls with you just because I want to get a sense for who's in the room. So you should see this uh, question pop up for you on your screen. And if you want to answer, that would be wonderful. I'll give folks a minute or so. I'd like to acknowledge that the uh, that the poll uh, is single choice, and we do uh, understand that people may have 
given the choice, may have selected more than one option. Thanks, David. Okay, great. It looks like um, most folks here are visual artists. I'm gonna um, end this particular question and I'm gonna bring up a different question for folks. Um, and again, if you know, if you might have um, more than one, but you can just pick the the primary the primary thing for you right now. What's your what's uh, what are you seeking as your main goal at the moment? Okay, great. So it looks like lots of folks are looking for exhibitions in public galleries or artist run centers and quite a number of folks are looking to sell their work through social media or through commercial galleries. And thanks for thanks for participating. Just one last question. This is a quick one. Okay, great. Um, this gives me a really good sense for where people are at. Um, and we'll have some time at the end for, for you to ask your questions. So in, I'm gonna go through the presentation. There's gonna be quite a lot covered in here. As you're listening, um, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, and then that way, you know, if, let's say you're, you have a question about a specific point in the presentation, and we can come back to it at the end, or you can um, hold your questions to the end, whatever is easier for you folks. I would, I will just say when I'm screen sharing in Zoom, everything disappears for me. So I don't see the chat. So I'm gonna rely on David to, to um, jump in if there's something urgent or folks are having trouble, um, like if there's technology issues, and the other thing, David, that I'll ask of you is just to be the timekeeper. Um, if maybe once we're getting close to 1240, if I'm still in the thick of presenting, just give me a nudge. Um, I also can't see. Yeah, I can't see anything but the presentation. I'll do my best to guide you. <laughs> Thank you. OK, great. So here we go. Um, I always put a little bit of a disclaimer at the beginning of these because um, it's a big topic and we're only talking for an hour. So I want to remind people that uh, you're all different artists and the kinds of payments uh, and opportunities that you're seeking are different. So um, there's no right or wrong way to be an artist or to show your work. Um, and that means that what's considered fair compensation is going to be unique for, for each artist. I hope that these guidelines will provide you with a place to start when you're advocating for yourself. And uh, in this workshop, I'll be focusing on standards in the Canadian context. Um, these uh, standards can vary quite a bit depending on where you are and the kind of work you make. So just bear that in mind. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, exhibition venues, uh, just because, like I said, depending on where you're showing your work, um, the payment that you'd be receiving differs. So in Canada, we have quite a few of these um, and you're probably familiar with a number of them. So the one of the categories is public gallery or museum. So this is something like uh, the Art Gallery of Hamilton, Art Gallery of Ontario, the National Gallery, the ROM. And these are funded by a mix of government and private funding. They exhibit artists, but they typically also have collections. 
And then we have artist-run centers like Hamilton Artists Inc., like Center 3. And uh, these are smaller organizations that in the 60s and 70s were started by artists. And today they're funded by the government, but also often receive sponsorship funding. And so there's some private funding as well. In these spaces, usually the focus is not on selling artworks. Um, and so because the focus is not on selling artworks, they will pay artist fees for exhibitions. Again, this is not for every single space out there, but this is just the general rule. And then there's commercial galleries that operate as a, as a business. The focus is on selling artworks that are to their clientele. And then we have festivals, which can be either not-for-profit or public. Um, so some of them may be businesses and they do um, often receive, if, if they're nonprofits, they will receive government funding. And the artist fees that they pay, it really depends on the festival. So some of them do, some of them don't. It depends on what sector you're in and the, the specific festival as well. And then we have less formal exhibition venues like cafes or pop-up spaces, markets, or smaller artist-driven initiatives. So some of this might be, let's say a group of artists get together and they rent a storefront and they put on a show for a weekend. Um, obviously, artist fees in that kind of space is going to be quite different or probably non-existent, but who knows? There, there are lots of different, different things out there. So the reason I, I introduced these things is because uh, you're going to have to bear them in mind um, when you're thinking about what is fair comp compensation in, in the spaces that you're showing. So um, we're going to start with the visual arts sector, and I want to talk a little bit about CARFAC. CARFAC is an organization that came about in the 60s and was made by artists. It's, it's really cool. It is kind of like a union um, for artists. And to my understanding, it's pretty unique for this kind of thing to exist. A lot of countries don't have this. Um, but what CARFAC does is it advocates for artistic work as work. Um, and it sets some um, recommendations for uh, what artists should be paid for the professional labor that they provide. So um, this text that I have on the screen is, is from the CARFAC website. They are, and you can see at the bottom, the CARFAC RAAV minimum recommended fee schedule is widely recognized as the national standard for remuneration for visual and media artists in Canada. And the important thing to remember is for galleries that receive public funding, arts councils that give those galleries the funding, so the grant agencies, um, they expect galleries to be paying artists based on this schedule. So Carfax sets a minimum and those galleries have to pay at least a minimum and hopefully they exceed, they exceed the minimum. I put some links down here. I hope that folks take some time to get familiar with Carfax. It's a really, really great tool. Um, and I wanna share with you a little bit of a snippet of what it looks like um, so there's uh, recommended fees for work uh, in, in different kinds of work. So there is, for example, royalties for exhibitions. And when we say royalties, uh, what we're referring to is the, the payment that should be paid to artists for the presentation of their work. The exhibition royalty does not include the cost of making an artwork or shipping the artwork or for you to travel there and stay there. And those are all different expenses. So the exhibition royalty that is recommended by Carfax should in, in, in theory, just be what you pay, you are paid to um, show your work. So you can see it on, on the screenshot, um, uh, a lot, of, a lot of categories here. So there's institutional categories. It says international two, international one, and then category three to one. Um, Carfax does this thing where they assign different um, expectations of artist fees based on how much money an organization has. So a category one organization is an organization that has an operational budget of under $500,000. And then it kind of goes up. The more your operating budget, the more you're expected to pay artists. So this is, for example, Hamilton Artists Inc. is a category one organization. So in 2022, we're expected to pay at least $2,161 for a solo exhibition. If it's a group exhibition, 
this number is going to get divided by the number of artists in the in the group show. Carfax has recommendations for all sorts of other things as well, such as installation time. Um, if there's, let's say, like more than six artists in a group exhibition, they recommend a higher fee because obviously if you divide this number by six, it's gonna be very small. Um, they have recommendations for how much artists should be paid when they sit on a jury, uh, when they lead a workshop, for example. So there's a lot of um, really helpful um, guidelines in Carfax that, that you can check out because obviously as artists, we do a lot more than just exhibit artwork. And then uh, in the media arts, we have an organization very similar to CARFAC. It's called IMA, the Independent Media Arts Alliance. Again, it's member driven, it's not for profit, um, and it's a national organization that advocates for media arts in, in Canada. So they represent lots of different organizations, and they also set a recommended fee schedule for the presentation of media arts. And this fee schedule, um, in some ways, it aligns with CARFAC, in some ways, it uh, goes in a slightly different direction because the nature of media arts is, of course, a little bit different. So it considers um, the duration of things, whether they're presented online or in person. And this fee schedule that IMA has is typically used by film festivals, media arts distributors, and it could also be used by galleries when they're doing film screenings. So again, there's a link in there. Um, this, both of these documents, CARFAC and IMA, change year by year. So every year there's a small increase um, for inflation. Uh, so the, the screenshots that I've provided for you in this uh, presentation are for 2022. Um, but uh, yeah, you can take a look at the website. You can see the fees for this year and then the next few years. The other thing that I'll mention is that IMA recently kind of did a huge overhaul of their fee schedule. So this fee is very, this, this document and this fee schedule is very new. And for folks who are familiar with IMA, you might recognize that it looks very different from what the document looked like before. So whereas CARFAC fees are minimum fees, what IMA has done as of this year is they've implemented a minimum fee and a recommended fee um, because they're recognizing that in the media arts sector, um, the fees are very low. They're much lower than they should be. And so they are, they've made the document in this way to give organizations um, a, a point to aspire towards. And the goal is that hopefully organizations can get to that point of the recommended fee within the next two or three years. So again, there's um, a breakdown based on how much uh, the organization has uh, their, their operating budget per year. So under 100,000, under 250,000 and so on. And it, there's also a breakdown based on the duration of the, the media film work or video work. So if it's shorter, it's a shorter fee. And this particular screenshot is for a single screening. There's also another um, chart for multiple screenings. So let's say an organization creates a program with your short film in it, and then they wanna show it multiple times, or they wanna put it on their website for two weeks. Um, IMA provides recommendations based on all of those considerations. Okay. Um, I'm going through kind of fast. I just wanna, before going into this next section, maybe wanna pause and see if there's any questions about um, those fee schedules from Carfax and IMA. There's uh, nothing in the chat at the moment, but I just wonder um, in my learning about these things, there's a, a direct correlation I know between uh, Canada Council for the Arts. When you're applying uh, for projects or programs, they ask you uh, to reference these uh, these these pay rates, which is which is excellent, and what they should be doing. Does that currently exist with the Ontario Arts Council? Are, are you aware of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a great question. So. Yeah, so when um, organizations like Hamilton Artists Inc. or Hamilton Arts Council receive government funding, um, the government organizations that provide funding to us expect us to be paying at least the minimum rates. And that's the case across the board. I think including the city of Hamilton grants um, because this, these are the recognized standards in the sector. So um, that's kind of, um, yeah, that, that's what's, what's expected 
if, if you're receiving a government grant that you are paying artists at least these minimums. I, I hope that organizations pay more if they can afford to. Um, and the other thing I should mention is that the CARFAC and IMA fees uh, are specifically for when artists are showing in um, public galleries, in museums, in artist-run centers, in other spaces where there is um, government funding. If your work is for sale um, or in a commercial gallery, those uh, recommendations don't apply anymore because your income is coming um, from a different source. I do have a, a question from Corey uh, that is, who gets paid fees and what do you do to register? I wonder if, uh, Corey, if you wanted if you want to un, uh, maybe invite Corey to unmute and elaborate on, on that question. Um, I'm going to find you. One second there. Hi, Kari. Hi. Yes, um, boy, this is all so new to me and I'm hungry to learn more. Um, I'm almost 10 years an artist now, or at least self-recognized as an artist. And my work has actually gone global. So I have work in Mongolia, China, um, in um, parts of Europe and, and so on. So I know my work stands alone, but I think I need to do more than what I've been doing. So I just, I'm, boy, I'm hungry to learn more. Um, the fees look intriguing. Um, so I, I, I don't know, this is all completely new to me. Your, your question was who gets paid fees and what, what do you do to right. register? So who gets paid the fees? Are we paying fees to the government? Is government paying fees to the artist? Um, is it paying fees to the institution that's that's dem that's showing your art? So there's a, a few kind of questions around that. And if I want to show my art, what do I need to do? So I can be part of that. Thank you, Barry. Uh, you're muted, Abida. Abida, you're currently muted. There we are. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. My computer is not having a very good time. It's completely frozen. But as long as you can hear me, that's good. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of a food chain, let's say. Um, organizations and galleries, nonprofit, not for profit organizations and public art galleries and artist run centers, those types of organizations receive grants from the government. And then it's their responsibility when they're showing artists work to pay those artists. So if you are having an exhibition at a, at let's say the Art Gallery of Hamilton, the Art Gallery of Hamilton is uh, responsible for giving you a check for an artist fee that is at, at minimum the Carfac amount. Um, that, that's basically the, the kind of, the way the system is set up right now. But the, in terms of getting shows, it really dif differs um, space to space. Sometimes artists are encouraged to apply. Other times curators find your work and they invite you. I think that will be a whole other workshop. But um, if you're showing in, in those kinds of spaces, then you can expect that they would pay you based on the CARFAC or IMA standards. Uh, we also have just uh, one more question from uh, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Chris asks, uh, so when you see a budget for a public art project, could you minus the, the guideline fee to then get an estimate for everything else? The guideline fee. Do you mean like an application fee to, to put forward your project? So when you look at a, an overall public art project, they normally project in that what the overall project budget is and so I guess Chris is asking if it would be uh, in that instance if you removed what the what the guide the guideline or recommended Carfac mm -hmm. fee rate would be would that give you an accurate sense then of, of the rest of the budget towards say materials installation all of those pieces right. That's a good question, Chris. Thank you for that question. So if let's say you're applying for a grant, um, typically granting agencies will give you um, 
they, they will have uh, guidelines uh, on how much of your, your grant request you can put towards your own time. So let's say you're applying to the city of Hamilton um, artist production grants. I think for a $5,000 grant, you are limited to no more than $2,000 towards your own compensation as an artist, which doesn't include materials or studio rent or any of these things. Um, so CARFAC can be a good standard for that, um, depending on the size of the grant. You know, like let's say you're getting a $40,000 grant, then probably you can, and it's a bigger project, you probably could pay yourself more. Sometimes CARFAC is not enough. Um, so you can use CARFAC as a starting point, um, but it really depends on the scale of the project. So for example, that chart that I showed is the CARFAC recommendation for an exhibition that's three months. Let's say you're working for a project that's gonna take you two years to complete, and you're thinking about how much to pay yourself over, over that length of, of working, let's say like five hours every week for two years. Um, so I guess my answer is yes and no. Um, it, it, it can help give you a ballpark um, for what's reasonable um, if you wanna make estimates, um, but sometimes uh, you'll wanna go above that. Okay, so pricing and selling artworks. This is specifically for those of you who make um, work that you wanna sell to people and maybe um, you're thinking about how to do that. I hope that the noise in the background is not too distracting. There's a lot of stuff going on at the, at the gallery today. <laughs> um, okay, so when artworks are for sale, artists are no longer um, receiving artist fees. So if you're showing your work in a commercial gallery, um, the gallerist is responsible for cultivating relationships with buyers and collectors to get the artist's work sold. The gallery will take a commission that's usually between 30 and 60% of the selling price of the artwork. So yes, um, if you're selling work in a commercial gallery, they will typically take a commission, which is between 30 and 60% of the selling price of the artwork. And this is something you would negotiate with your commercial gallery ahead of time. If you're selling work at art markets or holiday fairs or craft fairs, um, you will typically pay a tabling fee to sell your work and the artists would be responsible for installing and selling their own work. And because you're selling to the general public, usually the prices tend to be a little bit lower um, and the fair may or may not take a commission. One exception to this is art fairs. So you folks might have heard of um, fairs like Art Toronto or Art Basel Miami. Or art Basel has lots of different locations, but um, these tend to be large scale events. They're ticketed and they're kind of, um, for lack of a better term, they're bougier events. They're, they're targeting um, rich collectors. And uh, even though individual artists can get a booth and you know, bring their own work, it can be really expensive to do that. And so typically it's, it's commercial galleries that represent artists at these events and they are the ones that sell the work at these events. Okay, so when you're pricing your work, just some things to think about. Um, the scale, the size of your work and how much your materials cost, uh, how much your studio is costing, even if your studio is at home, uh, you're still allocating a portion of your your, your rent or your uh, mortgage towards your studio. So you can calculate that. The cost of your materials, um, and uh, sorry, your equipment. So that could be like your camera, your computer, um, internet, all those things. Your own time. So it takes labor to make art. So if you can calculate the, the labor, the time. Some artists are very meticulous about this and kind of keep a timesheet for themselves so that they can know specifically some others, some other artists are, more uh, flexible about it. So it, it, there's no right or wrong way, but it's important to keep track um, of, of the amount of time that you put into making a, a single artwork. And then you do other things than making art. So you might uh, do administrative work for yourself, like grant writing or posting on your social media or liaising with galleries, packing and shipping, cleaning your space, organizing, all of these things are part of um, your, your art making um, labor. And then you can also consider your training and schooling and all of the years of practice that have led to you having this skill. So obviously you're not gonna you know, put the entire cost of your college tuition towards the cost of an artwork, but you can calculate a, a small portion of that uh, when you're pricing artwork. 
Uh, you can think about whether the work is or an original piece or if it's a print or, an, or a multiple, um, that will affect the cost. Uh, where the work is going to be sold. So for example, if, if you're selling your work at a big fancy art fair, maybe you'll price it a little bit higher than if you were going to sell it um, at a holiday market, for example. Not to say that the, the, there's no like um, uh, value judgment between these, but just different contexts and different people that you're selling your work to. So one of the other considerations is target audience. Um, perhaps you're trying to sell your work to your uncle. Maybe you're going to give your uncle a deal. Um, but if, if the person buying your work is a, is a rich collector, you're maybe not going to give that guy a deal. Just, just some things to think about. Um, so yeah, of course, where the work is going to be sold. Um, and then uh, whether you're paying a commission. So if you're working with a commercial gallery that's taking 50%, you might consider uh, raising the cost of the work a little bit to, to make sure that what you're getting covers your expenses. You might be paying a tabling fee, let's say, if it's, if it's a fair, um, you might be paying gallery rent. And then you can also think about what stage of your career you're in, um, if the, the, the demand for your work. So if, if you already have an established audience of people who really wanna buy your work, then you can probably sell things for a little bit more money. If you're still an emerging artist, um, perhaps you're still building those connections and maybe you wanna set your prices a little bit lower in order to attract um, new buyers. Uh, there's this really amazing resource uh, from Sparkbox Studio about pricing work. Um, and I encourage folks to check it out. They have a little blog post and they also have a spreadsheet that helps artists anticipate all the different costs um, that, that, they, that they might incur. Okay, so um, lastly, we're gonna talk a little bit about negotiating for better payment um, or sometimes just negotiating for payment. <laughs> uh, so being an artist, uh, or sorry, rather a, a huge part of being an artist is being your own agent. Um, and, and I can't really say that enough. No one else is, or typically no one else is going to advocate for you unless, and unless you can afford to hire someone to do that work. Um, so it's, it's really, really important to advocate because if you don't ask, you never know if you could have, if you could have had a better opportunity. Um, so I encourage, always encourage folks to ask about payment up front. Um, you can use the CARFAC and IMA standards as a tool to negotiate. Um, for, as an example, when I uh, reach out to artists at Hamilton Artists Inc., all of our uh, opportunities here are selected through a jury. So artists apply to the Inc., and then the jury selects their work. And then I inform the artist, hey, congrats, your work was selected. When I send that first email, I always tell the artist how much they're going to be paid. Um, and I think that's really important because it can be awkward to ask about money. So I, I hope that um, we can all collectively build this culture of asking about money. It's, it's an important thing. We, we wanna know the answer to that question. Um, and also within that, it, it's helpful to ask for contracts or make letters of agreement or memorandums of agreement with the people you're working with. Um, so let's say you get, a, you get a representation at a commercial gallery, you wanna make sure that the things that you agreed with, with your gallerist as to what are the things that are your responsibility and their responsibility are recorded somewhere. So um, sometimes these things happen really informally in the arts, right? We're not always like, um, administrators in, in the capital A sense. So let's say you're like on the phone with the gallerist who's also your friend. And he says, you know, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll deal with framing your work. Um, it would probably be a good idea to send a follow-up email kind of summarizing what you discussed in your phone call so that there is a written record. And if worst case scenario, you come to a disagreement later, you can say, hey, here's what we agreed to. You, you know, you confirmed that we discussed this over the phone. Just to have your, you know, have your back covered. And if you're working with organizations that are unfamiliar with standards in the art sector, uh, you can, you know, take an opportunity to educate them, tell them about your costs and your labor. So recently I, um, this happens quite a lot. We get, uh, I get emails at the Inc uh, from uh, other organizations that wanna partner with us um, and want, want us to help them um, find artists or want us to select the artists um, for their for their event 
And the question that I always ask is, are you going to pay artists? And if they're not paying artists, we're not going to work with them because it's really important to us that uh, artwork be recognized as labor. It's work. So that's uh, that's always something that we, and I, I know that folks at the Arts Council also do this, is advocate on behalf of artists to make sure that the, the labor is recognized. And uh, this one is one of my favorites, is to talk to your artist friends about fees, because this is, is so important to help us be more transparent in, in this sector and to advocate collectively. So something that, uh, an example that I wanna give is a friend of mine uh, was recently offered a freelance job. Um, and they, and you know, sometimes people are not very good about being transparent. Companies are not very good at being transparent. So the company asked my friend about how much they wanted to be paid. And my friend was like, oh, well, I don't know. I've never, I've never worked in, in this kind of job before. And they asked a different friend of theirs um, how much they were getting paid. And their friend said, you know, I'm getting paid X number of dollars per day. Um, and my friend used that as a, as a kind of standard to, to request how much, that, how much they wanted to be paid. Um, but if they hadn't asked their friend for, for advice, they probably would have given a much lower rate than would have been standard in, in that sector. And that's, you know, companies sometimes do this to us because they know that we don't know. Um, and they kind of, uh, you know, they, they put you in the spot and you're, you're kind of thinking, oh, like if I give a fee that's too high, they might not want to work with me. If I give a fee that's too low, I'm kind of uh, not benefiting as much from the opportunity. Um, and they, they put it on us to, to have to like go through those mental gymnastics. But if we talk to each other, then we get a better sense for uh, what, is, what is typical. And lastly, this is a hard one, but I think it's really important uh, because, uh, you know, I, I, I think of, of any time as an individual artist, I'm um, advocating for myself or I'm telling a gallery, hey, you're offering me, for example, a Carfax fee for an exhibition that's three months, but the exhibition is going to be five months. Um, I, I hope that that leads to uh, galleries and organizations being more equitable to other artists in the future. So I think part of that is also um, refusing opportunities that don't pay you well or don't respect your labor. Because um, a lot of times artists get the, get the justification of, well, we're gonna promote your work really well. You're gonna get lots of exposure, but sadly exposure doesn't pay the bills. Um, so it, it's kind of union thinking, right? If, if we all um, uh, move towards these standards uh, collectively, then, then they have no, no choice but to respect that this, is, that this is what it takes to work with artists. Okay, so questions. Thank you so much, Abida. Um, I, we have a question from uh, Daniela uh, Easter. Daniela, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sure, thank you very much. Okay, um, I'll start by saying I am, I've been a working artist for 20 years. Um, COVID has changed my business completely, and so I'm in, in the pivot point. So I've had a lot of experience with the things that were discussed today on different levels. I was a founding member of the Beaux-Arts Brampton Artist Cooperative and have been there for 18 years. So I'm familiar with artist-run centers especially. That's a very big part of what I do. My concern is this. Everything now is all digitally based. In the past, when I was actively showing in galleries and everything. When I was doing those things years ago, um, there was a certain way that things were done. I'm re-entering that now in my new business and everything is of course online. So I have followed all my little steps and I've made myself a website, an e-commerce site. Now my concern is this, when I put my artworks on my website, and I affix a price to them. Then I go to a commercial gallery or an art fair or a public gallery, wherever I choose to go. And I have to adjust my pricing according to where I am. <laughs> How does that not af affect 
how people view my business practices. Because let's say I have a piece and I charge $1,000 for it on my website. But I go to an art fair in a little country town and I charge $500 for it there because of the clientele. But then I go to a Toronto art show and I charge $2,000 for it there. And the person who's interested in my work has gone on my website. Do, do you understand my question? I'm sorry if I'm not yeah, being clear. No, but, no. Um, so now my concern is, do I treat my artwork like any other product that I'm selling on my website? Because I sell more than just my paintings. I also sell what I call art for everyday life, which is um, uh, you know, objects of art that I create that are originals. So that I kind of have focused on that as if it's just a product that I sell, whereas my artwork for me personally is different. So now please, I, I appreciate some guidance in what the best practice is do I put my pricing for my, my paintings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really good question, Danielle. Thank you. I think this is also something that is unique to every artist. And of course, folks will have to make their own decision as to what feels comfortable for them. Um, what I've seen is sometimes artists who have commercial gallery representation actually are no longer responsible for send, selling um, their own works on their websites or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, it understand. really depends on the agreement with the commercial gallery, right? And the, what they are doing. Sometimes the commercial gallery will say, you know, um, I serve the GTA area. You can't get another commercial gallery representation in this region because I have this, you know, I have the right, the rights to sell to my, to my contacts <clears> in this region. And then if, you know, if that's the case, or if you're lucky to have that kind of um, relationship with a the gallerist, then you don't have to worry about having it on your website anymore. Or if you do, it's only there as a way of like showing your portfolio, or it might right. like lead back to the commercial gallery. But some art, you know, a lot of artists don't have that kind of relationship with gallerists. So you might um, decide to put it on your own website and put, instead of listing the price, say, contact me for price. Um, and then depending on the person who, who reaches out to you, you negotiate. I've also seen a lot of artists these days do like a sliding scale price. Again, it depends on where folks are selling their work. Um, but I, I know that some artists who are, who are um, selling on social media tend to do this quite a lot because it uh, enables the buyer to, you know, if someone has a slightly lower income that they can still access that artist's uh, work. Um, and then if, if someone can afford to pay a bit more than, than they do. Um, that's another thing to think about depending on the nature of the work. I, I, I cannot imagine that for bigger works that are more expensive, um, maybe that's not an option. Um, and then the third thing um, is to think about different works being sold in different places altogether. Um, so perhaps your, your uh, smaller pieces that you mentioned that are on your shop are the ones that go to um, like markets and fairs and they have a price point that's more suitable to that environment. Whereas the larger works that are more expensive, um, I guess it's also a matter of gauging how much success you have with those kinds of pieces being sold through your website anyway. Like, are you finding that you have, a, have good luck with selling those large scale works through your own contacts or are you relying mostly on art fairs or commercial galleries and if, if that's the case then maybe they um you prioritize pushing them out through that avenue as opposed to the the like online shop sort of thing so i think these are kind of it's a bit of a juggle and the reason i said what i said around um context and and pricing is i think it affects you know who can buy and and what you mm -hmm. can sell it's it's absolutely a consideration but it's not a hard and fast rule some artists decide that this is the price of this work and that is going to be the price regardless of where it's showing and who's buying it so that that's also an option if that feels okay. right the, the reason i'm asking is um previously when i was working with galleries and collectors and i mean i guess i should explain when i first started my career um, I was teaching on the side, um, kind of just to pay for the materials while I was producing the works because they take a long time. Um, but that teaching actually, when, once my children were born, took over and I decided to concentrate on my art education teaching and which I've done for the rest of the time. So now I'm returning to the art world 
um, in a whole different world. So a lot of the things, uh, some things still apply. A lot of what you said today, it was like, yep, yep. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. That's still there. Um, and, but there are a lot of things that have changed and that the whole thing with the pricing and my collectors. So for example, I've always had a saying like when, when you're at an art, um, art fair, you know, it's just original art. It's only artworks. Someone's going to come up and say, what's the best price you can give me? Okay. Or can you, can you give me a discount on this? Can you pay the tax? And my response is always, I am so sorry. I cannot discount my work because it's not fair to my collectors. And I really believe that I want my work to go up in price. I never want my work to come down in price. And so what I have done instead was I has, have always offered a gift with purchase. So I will say, I don't offer discounts on my original works. However, I, I am offering today with the purchase of any original piece over a certain amount of money, this item, which is usually cards or a print or, or something like that of my works. Because I firmly believe that the person who purchased my art, original artwork, their piece should go up in value. That's what I want. I want my collectors to have pieces that are going to increase in value. So I am pretty concerned about putting numbers and I have, that's what I feel bad about is I've actually put numbers on my pieces, but now I'm second guessing myself. And I feel like, like should, I, should I take them down before anyone notices? Um, do you understand what I mean? Like, it's just, I don't want to assume that the person who's looking at it can afford it. That's insulting. If you value something, you find the money for it. So I don't know. I, I just, uh, I'm at that point where I'm either going to take down those prices and just put up the pictures and if they're really interested, they'll ask. Yeah, I mean, these are all really good, good considerations. And I really like that strategy of yours with offering a little gift. Maybe that'll be a good tip for some of the other artists in the room. It's, um, it works, on how to it works honestly, <laughs> for a $10 little kit set of cards, I have sold many originals because they want the cards. So it does work. It does work. But, you know, awesome. like I just wanted some advice going forward on as I'm putting things together. So I appreciate your comments. Thank you. It's a really good conversation to, to continue. And I can see that uh, Aoife in the chat has, has sent you a message, Danielle. Danielle, okay, if you'd like I'll to follow that. up on that. I have, uh, we have a question that says, can I apply for a grant after the exhibition is done? Can I apply two grants for two exhibitions at a time? So some of the questions here are about grants and I can, um, I can invite, uh, can I apply for a grant after the exhibition is done? Can I apply for two grants after two exhibitions? for two exhibitions at a time. I'm not fully- I Well, thank you, um, Bayerby, for your question. I think for this session, we're gonna focus on um, payments, uh, but if you wanna send me an email separately, we can talk about grants. I, I would say with grants, it really depends on what you're applying to and um, which art council, they all have different guidelines and eligibility requirements. So you would have to check on their website about what they what they uh, allow. Uh, Abada, I wonder you had uh, commented earlier about um, there was a reference that you made in regards to uh, to identifying career level, and I wonder if uh, do Carfac and EMA do they have a description of the different career levels, or is that left open to interpretation, or what sort of if an if an artist is is wanting to understand where they fit in terms of being established or emerging when it comes to developing and, and adhering to, to fee scales, where, where would be the, the first place you would look for, for that sort of benchmark? Yeah, um, so Carfac does hint to that a little bit. Um, so for instance, for exhibition dues, they have a section uh, that uh, recommends fees for retrospective 
typically you wouldn't have a retrospective unless you're fairly, you know, mid-career or established artists with many different bodies of work to show. Um, so they have a recommendation like that, but neither Carfac or IMA um, suggest different fees for an emerging artist versus an established artist because they recognize that the labor of producing work is the same. But what I do think can be a consideration around that is when artists are selling their work. So if you're a more established artist and your work is in high demand, then like Daniela was saying, it, it can perhaps be assumed that your work has gone up in value over time and you might have uh, slightly higher prices for your work. If you're um, you know, a newer artist or, or less, less years of experience under your belt practicing, then you might start with slightly lower prices and raise them up over time as you build your build your audience. Um, but in terms of knowing whether you're established or emerging, um, there's different guidelines. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. Some granting agencies have um, uh, you know, grants for emerging art artists versus established artists, and they have their own definitions for what they consider emerging and what they consider established. And so I, you know, artists can, can use those as a benchmark, but I think it really has to do with how many connections you have in, in the art sector. You know, I think when you get to a certain point and you're kind of walking around and everybody knows you, <laughs> I think at that point you've gotten past the emerging um, line. But I, I, you know, it's also important to say in some cases there are artists who are immigrants who have had you know, really established practices before coming to Canada and then they come to Canada, it feels like they're starting again. It's not to say that they're emerging from an, from an experience point of view, but more so in terms of building relationships and being able to get exhibitions. So um, these are, you know, these are all things that we consider when we talk about emerging and established. Sometimes, you know, an, an artist might be quite established as a, let's say a painter, but they are an emerging writer at the same time, or they're taking a pivot in their practice. Let's say they've spent 30 years being a painter. Everybody knows them as a painter, but now they want to work in media art and they have absolutely no experience in that area. And they're, that would be considered um, an area in which they're emerging. So I think these are all things to keep in mind when we use those words. Some, you know, th these definitions can be, can be kind of limiting um, as well, but it is what we have at the moment. David? Would you like to mention the uh, professional development series pieces we have on funding? Yes, so those uh, for the people that have questions around the uh, the grants and funding, there are two uh, two videos that have been published uh, from previous professional development sessions uh, from Ontario Arts Council and Canada Council for the Arts, and you may be able to find some of the answers to the questions that you're looking for in there. Um, Abadar, I was going to uh, publish the information for your personal website and Instagram, as well as uh, Hamilton Artists Inc and uh, the Instagram for, for the ink. Um, I wonder if you could just talk uh, just a little bit about what, uh, what being a member of the ink entails and, and what, that, uh, what that does give artists access to. I, I really feel that much of the, the discussion today and the presentation has emphasized uh, the positivities that come from, from connecting within a community and forging those relationships and, and building networks. So I'll, I'll put that in the chat if you'd be willing to just speak to that. Yeah, for sure. This is a great question. So for those who may not know, Hamilton Artists Inc. is a local artist-run center. It's a not-for-profit charitable organization. It's been in Hamilton since 1975, so quite, a, quite an old one. Um, and because we're an artist-run center, our, our mandate is to support artists experimenting and taking risks and trying new things. And the focus is not on selling artworks. So when artists apply to have exhibitions at the Inc, everything is through an application. Um, your work would be juried by uh, a jury of other artists and curators um, and, and selected through the pool of candidates. You know, so it sometimes can be competitive. Um, and so when, when artists have exhibitions, they receive an artist fee based on the CARFAC recommendations. Um, and for any kind of professional opportunities that we do, let, let's say artist talks or artists facilitating workshops or artists having screenings, artists are always paid either at the CARFAC uh, recommendation level or at the IMA um, 
And then in terms of becoming a member for folks who are interested in that, Hamilton Artists Inc. has an annual membership, which is between 15 to $40 per year. Um, and with that membership, uh, artists are invited to participate in our annual members exhibition, which is not juried. Everybody can just bring in artwork and artists can also apply for exhibitions in our members gallery. So if, for folks who've been in the space, it's the smaller gallery um, at the entrance there. Um, and artists exhibiting in the members gallery do get paid. Um, and then you also get access to a whole lot of other opportunities like free entry to the AGH, you get discounts on workshops at Center 3, you get discounts at a number of businesses in Hamilton, um, you get, I think, a 10% discount at uh, Mixed Media if, if you're buying art supplies, uh, lots, of, lots of other little perks as well. But uh, I, maybe I'll just throw up on the screen one last slide here. This, is, this was my last slide. So if, if you do wanna get in touch with me after the workshop, I encourage you to reach out to my work email, programming at the ink.ca. Um, and I'm happy to chat with you and um, you know, get to know you and answer questions you might have. Um, I, I am working part-time at the ink at the moment. So if I'm a little slow responding to your email, um, be patient with me, I will get back to you. Thank you all so much for listening. It's been a pleasure to host. Thank you so much for, for sharing both your contact information and all of the information in the presentation session. I, I really do um, encourage everyone to, to reach out and connect. Uh, my own experience as an artist has been about learning through uh, forming new relationships with everyone else. So I would like to thank you on behalf of Hamilton Arts Council, Abadar, and everyone who has attended today, um, and to encourage everyone to follow up on the following professional development sessions, which you can find on the website. If you have any questions about today's session, you can email me, community at hamiltonartscouncil.ca, and you will be hearing from me following this session with links to the session session recording as well as the slide information that was presented. I am going to stop the recording at this point.